Okay, I guess we can get started. Uh, so thank you all uh, for coming, for joining this, this panel. Uh, today I'll be serving as moderator. Uh, I'm Cassio. And in this panel, we have uh, four uh, panelists here. Uh, I will say in the order that is appearing in my screen. Uh, we have here Dr. Uh, Etienne Roche from uh, University Reading. And he serves as editor for Rescience uh, Magazine, uh, journal, sorry, <laughs> Rescience Journal, uh, Rescience C and Rescience X. Uh, I think he will uh, tell us uh, in more details what these are, but they are um, journals that focus on, that are focused on papers about uh, reproducibility, well, that replicate our works, right? So I'll let the I'll let he hand the, the details later, um, but just uh, keep on with the introducing our speakers. We also have here Dr. Uh, Anna Cristalli, who uh, who is in University of Sheffield, if I remember correctly, right? And she is uh, she organizes uh, reproducibility hackathons, uh, repro hacks. I think we will listen a little bit about it. And we also have here uh, Dr. Sergei Frolov uh, from Pittsburgh University. Uh, he is an experimental physicist. So a, a quite different uh, field here. And uh, as, I, as I hear, he also uh, do some sort of reproducibility at the very least, uh, I, either from the from bottom up, or real just uh, picking, uh, reanalyzing data, available data from uh, previous experiments done by uh, all the researchers, and he had some uh, at least interesting uh, experience in these past two years. I don't know if you'll talk precisely about that today, but we are very excited to hear about it. And Dr. Stephen Eagling is also uh, here with us. Uh, he is one of the co-founders of CodeCheck, which is a platform for peer reviewing code. It's, I guess it's a simple way of putting it. Um, and I guess he'll also tell us a little bit about his platform. And I hope we can then discuss on about different approaches on how to engage people in actually reproducing uh, research and, uh, and papers, which is, well, it's definitely not something trivial and it requires some engagement. So uh, I hope we can have a very fruitful discussion today. The, um, uh, I think we should start, right? And let us go in the order of presentation that I just said here. Uh, if, we, if, we, if you're ready, then uh, please, uh, Dr. Etienne Rocha, uh, it's with you. Sure. You can call me Etienne. Okay. Um, so I am um, an editor in, um, uh, so I, I represent the family of journals called Rescience. Um, we currently have two uh, venues. Rescience C is the oldest. Um, it's a, an academic journal for computational work. So um, authors will reproduce uh, other people's code and other people's uh, results and um, uh, it, we will peer review this work and publish it on that on that platform. It's very much about code and, and um, uh, analysis, basically. And um, and recently we launched Research X for experimental experimental work, um, where people can uh, publish uh, re experimental work, uh, reproduced work, basically. That was short. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so let's go ahead with uh, Dr. Anna Cristalli. Uh, please, uh, I think she has some slides for us. Yeah, okay. Um, go ahead. I, I was given seven to 10 minutes, so I decided to actually use some slides and uh, uh, maybe give a bit more of my personal background as well um, to give some detail of sort of where my perspective's coming from. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides now. I feel a little bit overkill now, but uh, we've got an Sorry. hour and a half. No, 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 no. We've got an hour and a half. I can take a little bit of it. Okay, so uh, everyone can see my slides? Yeah. 
Yes, excellent. So yes, hello um, everyone from Sheffield and thanks for inviting me to participate, Casio. So I am uh, Anna Cristalli. I'm a research software engineer here at the University of Sheffield, uh, where our teams uh, help researchers do more with their code and data. You can find me on various locations on the internet, but I'm probably more active on GitHub. And seeing as we're going to have an hour for in-depth discussion on our topic, uh, here I just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, give you a little bit more about my background and projects I'm involved in uh, that, that um, will hopefully help give an idea of where my perspective is coming from, where my areas of expertise lie, and where they don't. <laughs> So uh, my background is actually in marine ecology. Uh, and yes, boats are really fun. They're hard work, but they are fun. Uh, but in, on, in all honesty, uh, in my PhD, I didn't actually get much time to collect data on boats. Uh, instead, I was a complete data parasite working with long-term plankton survey data and satellite data and spent most of my time working in R and uh, trying to get a hold of process, combine and analyze uh, complex data. Uh, I got to make lots of maps and I uh, really fell in love with R and data science and programming in general. Uh, and it became very clear to me that um, after my PhD, you know, this was the most exciting thing I've learned and this is what I wanted to focus on. Um, but even before my PhD, there were a couple of experiences that were quite formative into what I would wanna do afterwards. Um, and the first one was being a quality assurance auditor for a contract research organization. So um, their research was governed by good laboratory practice regulations. And so they took quality assurance really seriously. Um, and our unit would go uh, into uh, active research, inspect it when it was ongoing, audit final reports and raw data and, and sort of feedback our findings to management. Um, uh, the experience taught me that human error is pervasive, even when you're doing very standardized uh, research, uh, um, and that inspecting people's works is quite delicate business, uh, and that um, sort of finger pointing and shaming people doesn't really work, that it's, it's far better to uh, sort of focus on system level solutions and make it hard to make mistakes and easier not to. Um, and then for my next job, I, I worked for an extreme sports equipment distributor. And this actually taught me the hard way, the importance of uh, data management. Uh, and that's because sort of uh, having to explain to one of your dealers uh, that an item that was showing one in stock, you promised them for next day delivery was in fact out of stock is, is kind of really awkward. So the, the sort of direct and immediate consequences of that uh, database error was a really strong incentive for me to, you know, physically check edge cases and think about how how things can go wrong. So, uh, and and it's something I find sometimes in science is the fact that maybe we're a little bit uh, uh, further away from immediate consequences, or no one's checking directly what we're doing. Kind of has the has the opposite sort of incentive in terms of checking often. Now, um, so lots of these experiences and interests sort of came together when I was finishing my PhD and I finished at a time when uh, research had been for some time becoming more computational and the reproducibility crisis was in full swing uh, and, and increasing calls for sort of opening up science. Um, and at the same time, there was an increase in appreciation that the, the skilled required to tackle some of these issues were consistently being lost from academia out to industry. Um, and, and this is really what the research software engineering position uh, uh, ca came about to address. And I was really lucky to, to join the team in Sheffield soon after it was established. And uh, the, our team supports researchers through uh, software engineering or consultancy. It uh, advocates for better practices and it promotes sort of capacity building through, through training, all of which kind of completely fit the type of involvement I wanted to have uh, with academia. Um, another sort of relevant project is uh, I'm also an editor for R Open Sci. So uh, R Open Sci helped develop R packages for the sciences. 
uh, via uh, community driven learning and review and maintenance of uh, contributed software in R. Uh, now, um, the, the review process is actually the, what really underpins and brings together the community. And what I really enjoy about this particular review process is that it's generally very productive and rarely uh, really combative. Um, it is carried out in the open and the community is generally very welcoming, but I think the tone of the review process is more a result of the incentives involved and in that reviewers represent potential users and rarely competitors of the software that they're reviewing, which means that, that often the incentives for both authors and reviewers align and that you know they want uh, a software that's well functioning and user as user friendly as possible. And then now probably the most relevant project to today's topic, which I'm likely gonna draw on uh, most in today's discussions is the uh, Reaper Hack project. So briefly, Reaper Hacks are one day hackathons where participants attempt to reproduce a paper from uh, associated code and data and feedback their experiences to authors. Oh, sorry. So uh, they provide a sandbox environment for practicing reproducibility, both as a creator as well as a user of such materials. Um, and I guess it's a good place to point out that, that when I say reproducible, I mean getting the same result using the same code and data. So a typical Reaper hack inv event involves inviting authors to submit papers for review uh, leading up to the event. And then hopefully that generates an interesting paper list. Then on the day, participants will choose paper they wanna work on uh, and then spend the rest of the day attempting to reproduce it. Uh, we do regroup throughout the day to share experiences. Uh, we've also had relevant talks uh, um, in some remote events we've run, but the, the most important aspect is that by the end of the day, participants provide feedback to the authors. So participants get practical experience in reproducibility with real materials, uh, which they can implement in their own work, while authors get valuable feedback and validation from others engaging with their materials. They often have put a lot of effort into creating them. Now, so far we've had good feedback from participants and authors alike. Uh, we feel like we've got a successful format now and are getting increasingly more requests for advice and support uh, from others to run such events. Uh, we've shared and made the infrastructure we've been using as reproducible as possible, but admittedly it's not as straightforward as we'd like it. So we spent a lot of time recently uh, developing a hub for our activities. Uh, so this will include a central paper list, a place for organizers to administer events, and for participants to view papers and submit their reviews. Um, and we're hoping this will really simplify the logistics of running an event and open the activity up to more people. Now, if you're interested in Reaper hacking, at the minute you can join us on Slack or follow us on Twitter. Uh, consider hosting your own event, uh, submit one of your papers or join one of our events. And there will be one next month to celebrate the launch of the hub. And at this particular moment, you can also help by testing out the hub we're still putting finishing touches on the dev hub before we move it to the live one, uh, which will be eventually reprohack.org. So feedback is welcome. Um, so I'm um, coming to the end. I just wanted to close by summarizing some of the key takeaways of these experiences and, and sort of working in this space uh, for a few years now. So um, I feel we've definitely made progress in making the case for reproducibility and transparency and more code and data is definitely being published. Uh, but I do feel there's some way to go still to ensure the materials are, are fit for purpose. Uh, I think it's partially because we don't have a clear definition of expectations of such materials. Uh, and, and that will be necessary for us if really want to teach and review and ultimately be able to reuse them. And, and, and at the minute, we also don't formally engage with such materials or, or practice producing or using them. And then once we do define expectations, we can start reaping the benefits of convention uh, by uh, producing tooling, automation, templates, uh, et cetera. 
And then finally, I feel Rebra Hacks can help with all this because not only do they provide a low pressure environment for to build capacity, but they also allow us to evaluate different approaches to uh, reproducibility uh, in terms of fitness for purpose. So uh, thanks again to Casio for inviting me. And I just wanted to extend the thanks to the Rebra Hack core team as well. Uh, N8 Center for Excellence in Computational Intensive Research, uh, Software Sustainability Institute, and the RSC team at the University of Sheffield for their sponsorship and support of the project. So I'm sorry, Etienne, I took some of your time. And that's me. Thank you, Anna. Um... I already have some questions, but I will just uh, move on for the next uh, to the next panelist, so we can then uh, enter engage the discussion. Uh, if the audience has any question, you can submit to the Q and A box at any time, and we will pick it up later. We have uh, plenty of time for some uh, nice discussions later on. So uh, moving on to uh, Dr. Sengri for love. Uh, you have a slide. Uh, you are on mute. So I also whipped uh, some slides because it looks like that's going great for Anna. Um, and I had some almost ready to go. So yeah, my name is Sergey. Um, I am an experimental physicist. Now that can mean a lot of different things. You may think um, particle physics like a big collider in Switzerland or in Chicago. I'm not that kind of physicist. Um, you may think telescopes, um, I'm not that kind of physicist. Um, I have a experimental lab, uh, which is uh, human size. Here you can see a picture of it with uh, machines, which are cryostats. Um, and um, I run a research group, which is a, you know, of order 10 people. Um, and the subject of our research is uh, quantum physics, um, also known as condensed matter physics, solid state physics. And um, in very short, what we do is, uh, you all know chips that are in your cell phone, um, your laptop. So we take chips like that, but made of different materials. And we subject them to extreme conditions, like in these uh, machines you see on the screen, uh, we can submerge them into ultra low temperatures, you know, millikelvins, so almost absolute zero temperature. Uh, or we can apply extreme magnetic fields, you know, thousand times the Earth's magnetic field, that's in the natural field we are all living. Um, and under those extreme conditions, the chips, the electronic devices, um, you know, the new physics comes out of them, um, quantum physics. Um, and so we do basic research on this kind of physics. Uh, we're funded by mostly government. Uh, but there is a strong interest in this for technology, and this technology is a quantum computer. So you take a chip, electronic chip that is similar to the one in your computer, you put it in the quantum realm, and uh, maybe you can use it to store and control quantum information, and that can come with huge computational boosts for certain problems. So this is down the road and I'm not building such a machine, I'm doing basic science, but there is this um, interest factor. Um, and so um, compared to Etienne, Anna, and also Steven, uh, I am actually like a little ant in the trenches. I'm just responsible for my own research group. I don't um, uh, run a community uh, effort, at least not at this moment. Uh, so I'm a case study, right? I'm a case study. I have done some reproducibility research recently, and it's related to this idea from 1930s uh, that there could be this uh, bizarre, fascinating particle that is its own antiparticle, and it can be found in the chips like the one I'm studying. And it all got started by our paper when I was a postdoc in uh, Holland, uh, where we reported some sightings of maybe some signatures of this effect almost 10 years ago. Um, so you can see a transistor-like device um, now in color from a cover of science from that time. And so there is this high interest in this. You can get published in Science and Nature. And if you just look at how the field took off, uh, halfway 
uh, the screen is where the transition happened from sort of a low level where it was an sort of obscure interest in different fields of physics. And then uh, it kind of takes off and that's uh, roughly where we entered the field. And so it's a huge area with thousands of papers being published. Um, it is uh, highly promoted in all kinds of news outlets. Um, and um, well, uh, like I mentioned, uh, it carries this promise of um, a stable, powerful quantum computation. And that's why um, also Microsoft um, invested hugely in this. So there is, I don't get money from Microsoft, but other people do. Um, and, and so there's been a lot of uh, pressure. It's a high visibility area um, in which a lot of um, high impact papers were published. And um, we, we're doing similar research in my lab here in Pittsburgh. And at some point we got uh, you know, spooked by some of the results because uh, we were seeing something similar, but we're not arriving to the same conclusions, right? And you know, there is no strict reproducibility in our field. We can talk about that later. Um, but we came close to just not understanding how people arrive to their conclusions. So we asked for their data and wow, we got blown away. There were big problems in uh, other people's data actually, Personally, it was also difficult because it came from my former postdoc group where I did my postdoc. Um, and so um, we got this paper retracted from Nature um, after a lot of complaining. And here you can see the timeline on the screen. This is a very painful and long process. And we are now engaged in a couple more like that, uh, also with top journals like Nature and Science. Um, and every time it is a huge personal effort um, that takes a lot of time and emotion and uh, also thinking how to explain issues and stuff. So I don't really recommend it, but uh, <laughs> we find ourselves in this, in this trench. Um, so here's an example of what we found. Uh, so the bottom um, the figure here is uh, from that retracted nature paper and it um, you know, makes a powerful case for the existence of these Majorana particles that I mentioned. But uh, when we got actual data from the people, you can see a segment between the magenta lines is actually missing. So they cut it out and they glued together the scan and they also cut off pieces on left and right. So it's interesting because they used real data that they took with their instruments, right? And then they just uh, did some manipulations with it to hide imperfections and deviations from the theory. So they didn't make up data. Uh, they manipulated data. But another thing that they did, and I show it here with cartoons, um, they selected data uh, in a non-representative way. And that's a big issue in our field that um, a paper is not a result of processing of a set of data, which you could do with a code, and then you can rerun the code and see if it gives a result. It is really just a, a, a book a little book with pictures that tells a story and the pictures are individual data sets. So you could be ta have taken one, 10,000 data sets and then you show five in the figure papers. So they're really just illustrations. And there is a huge trust that you put in the author, right? Um, that they selected the pictures for the paper in a representative way. So here in the middle, I see, you see all these objects are they're semiconductor nanowires and they grow in all kinds of directions. They have all kinds of spooky, weird shapes, but then you just focus on the perfect one in the middle and make that your figure one, right? And you can do that also real time. You, you start seeing that the data doesn't look good and you look away from that regime. So that is harder to detect. So uh, as far as community work, I, I, I think I'm gonna do more and more as time goes by, but so far I have written these two things. One got published in Nature, one in uh, Physics, which is a American Physical Society magazine. Um, and I hope it uh, gave people a lot of food for thought. And in particular, in my case, I've been you know, observing the reproducibility crisis from afar. And I thought it doesn't concern us, the physicists, you know, the the kings and queens of science where we work with hard facts, data is data, uh, you know, you cannot fool a physicist. Uh, and in fact, the uh, reproducibility crisis is ubiquitous, it hits every field and the more self-assured fields are probably hit the strongest. 
Um, so in our case, what helps a lot uh, really is if people share data and, um, you know, so, you know, if you, if you write a paper and you put these words in your paper, um, additional data available upon request, that's good, but just don't write it, just share your data. And there is now this platform Zenodo, which is created by physicists uh, at CERN, the particle ones with a big collider. Uh, which works very reliably and they give you 50 gigabytes per record. So just use that, share all your data, just dump it there. Um, and that's a good starting point uh, for reproducibility in our field. So that, that's all I got. Very much. I'm already now full of questions, but I will hold on until Stephen has uh, made his introduction. Uh, full disclosure, I, I actually did my master's and PhD on the theoretical field of Majorana uh, Fermions, so I will have to actually hold myself to not go too much into the details. <laughs> and uh, actually, I once participated in the, in the Ripple hack, and I did uh, some, uh, some reproducibility on Majorana uh, code, too. So uh, it is a... It is actually not so far from one another as one might think. We are kind of close here. <laughs> so next, um, please, uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Eglin, uh, do you do you have your slides? Should I uh, uh, share your slides for you? I should be able to. Let me just see if I can. Okay, great. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, pro. Okay, can you see them now? Like we can Cassia, see it now. Can you see them? Yes, we yep. can see it now. Perfect. It took okay. some time to load, but we can see it. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for organizing this session this afternoon. I, mean, I just put the link to these uh, slides in the chat, and I apologize in advance if I have to run off and drop my camera or whatever. I've got childcare and puppy issues this, uh, this afternoon, unexpectedly. Um, this is joint work with my colleague, Daniel Nust from uh, the University of Munster. Um, it's the Cochex system, which is an open science initiative to facilitate sharing of computer programs and results presented in scientific publications. And I have a few declarations and acknowledgements. Um, really, the idea here, sort of following on quite nicely from Sergey, is that what we're doing at the most in the scientific world right now is sharing, sort of exporting our, our work. We're exporting it to the world, just as this shiny, very, uh, very carefully curated PDF, these papers that we're writing. And as we saw from Sergey's example, uh, showing there quite nicely, is that Quite often people are free to sort of cherry pick their results and show what works best. Um, what we're encouraging is to really share what's on the left side of the, uh, of the dotted line. So this is inside the lab. All of this mess that we have that somehow we boil down into the paper. Um, this is a classic, if you just have the paper, there's no way that you can solve the inverse problem and get all of this result, all of this stuff. Right, so that's uh, that's an inverse problem which we can't solve. But if I share this with you, there's a small chance. Still, there's a small chance because you may have different interpretations, but you may be able to get the same paper. So our Kochek philosophy is trying to get to sharing more of these things: the data sets, the the programs, the models, the results, and all the statistics. Sharing all of that in its entirety. So. Really the start for me, for Kochek, was actually from this, when I saw this article by Nick Barnes in 2010, who talked uh, very provocatively and came up with this uh, article, this opinion in Nature, publish your code, it's good enough. And I just thought this was very, very clear and precise. It was partly, I think Nick had a background in climate science and there was a challenge at the time within the UK climate science community about code not being shared and spurious results. So, there is a growing, and I think it is getting better, there is a growing movement to share code and be able to, uh, uh, to work at that level rather than at the level of a paper. I put down some contemporary approaches that sort of are complementary to what I'm going to tell you about next, CoCheck, for example, CodeOcean, which Nature has been trialing, 
and uh, a French system cascade for certifying reproducibility of confidential uh, data. So the co-check philosophy is very straightforward. What we're trying to do is to make a, a very low bar for entry to sharing code. Um, so a system like CodeOcean is very nice. It sort of has got these computational capsules that you can go onto the website and you can rerun them and everything. Um, they set the bar, I think, very high by trying to make the code reproducible forever for everyone. And what we've done, so you've got the two dimensions there. Who is it reproducible for and for how long? What we've done is to go to completely the other end of those two dimensions and just to say, was the code reproducible once for one other person? So that is pretty much, we think, the lowest bar that we could imagine. And we wanted to do that deliberately just to sort of get things off the ground. Um, so what we do as a code checker is that we check that the code runs and then it generates the expected number of output files. We don't even explicitly say, are they exactly the same output? Because that becomes very difficult. And that's a uh, subjective definition of whether the results are the same. Um, so we just assume that you know if they can if those outputs can be generated somebody else who is an expert can look at them and uh, compare and uh, evaluate them and finally there we explicitly do not check the validity of the code whether it is correct we just simply says we simply say does this run generate things that uh, they report they can run um, I'm going to slip, probably skip over this slide in the interest of time, unless people want to come back to it later. Um, so there are different communities. We've got the author who provides the code and the data and provides instructions on how the code can be run. There's the code checker, which is kind of like a scientific peer reviewer, although, as I say, they're not explicitly reviewing the code. They're just checking that it runs code. If it works, they uh, can write a certificate uh, and we host everything. Just like Sergey was saying, we host all of our outputs, like the certificates and the artifacts generated, we host them on Zenodo so that they're, they're archived away. And then the publisher in a journal setting will oversee this process and actually help depositing the artifacts and persistently publishing the certificate. We think this is a great system. We think there are lots of uh, people that can benefit from it. First of all, the author gets an early check that their code works. It's always nice to know that somebody else can run your code and get the same results. The code checker gets an insight into late, latest research uh, methods. The publisher gets a citable certificate with the code and data bundled to share, which should increase the reputation of published articles. So no longer will that sentence data available on upon request be needed because they will already, as a result of writing the certificate, the data are there, they have to be available for the code checker. Peer reviewers doing the scientific peer review can check and look at the certificate and they can, so they don't have to worry about checking the code. And finally, the reader can see the certificate and immediately get working with the code because they know it already. It's guaranteed to run, uh, or, sorry, it's not guaranteed to run. It's guaranteed that somebody else could run it. So that means that they can get started with it. Um, on our website, we've got a register with that, which this is an old slide. I think we've got something like 25 or 26 code checks. I just wanted to point out probably the most uh, uh, controversial or interesting one was we actually code checked the Imperial College model of coronavirus transmission that was used uh, or helped to uh, sort of convince the UK government in March 2020 to do the lockdown. This at the time was a very controversial decision because the code and data were not available. Nobody could understand this big model. The group themselves admitted that it was a long sort of, it being a piece of code that has evolved over, I think something like almost 20 years. Um, Microsoft and GitHub actually helped tidy up the code a bit. Um, and then I worked with uh, the Imperial group and we did a code check and we could actually show that the results were reproducible despite what people were saying. Uh, the strap line there, it ain't pretty, but it works, uh, was something I saw on Twitter about it, which I thought was quite nice. Um, this is not the be all and end all of reproducible checking, right? Um, we've got several limitations. We don't really know how we can give 
valuable credit for code checkers who've got some ideas. It's very easy for authors to cheat this system, right? Um, they could hide their outputs in the in their code bundles that they provide. But who really cares? Because it's all open, so somebody else will eventually find it if they're interested enough. Um, the author's code and data must be freely available. That's pretty much our working philosophy. Um, and of course, that was probably going to hit some uh, hit some problems at some point with, uh, for example, uh, confidential data sets. We have a deliberately low threshold for gaining certificates, which over time, I think we may be able to bring up. We don't obviously have endless resources, so we can't sort of just rerun everybody's high performance jobs uh, just like that. For example, with the COVID model, I was lucky to get some local support on high performance computer to run it because it was seen as critical, but that won't routinely be available. And we cannot yet support sort of all possible workflows and languages. We're dealing with the common ones that uh, the code checkers know, like R and Python and C and so forth. Um, so next steps, we're trying to embed this into journal workflows so that uh, uh, this can be sort of part of the peer review process. We'd like to train a community of code checkers and this is something that there's a good sort of overlap and synergy with what Anna has been doing in the repro hack. Um, and we are looking for funding to sort of get this sort of a permanent code check editor to oversee this process. So if you'd like to see more information on this uh, code check, please visit this website, codecheck.org.uk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So, um, uh, okay, we get uh, here some, there is one short question in the chat, perhaps two, but um, let us try to uh, first thing, uh, go straight to the discussion. Um, and if you would allow me, I would like to pick up um, from the last slide of Anna, um, where you, I guess you summarize as the limit, uh, in a sense, limitations that seems to pervade everyone's problem in the first sentence that there's a challenge of going from theory to practice. So could you, could you develop a little bit more about that? And if the other panelists have something to say on, on their fields, on their perspectives too, I would like to ask more about this. Yeah, sure. That, that's sort of what we're finding through the Reaper hack experience is we do see a lot more people motivated and willing to open up their code and, and opening their code up. Uh, we have seen more training of people to, to write better code, maybe discussions of version control, where to reposit stuff. But often what happens when you uh, come out the other side and try and work with some of it is because we don't have a formal way until code check. So code check actually, and I really like, I'm really glad Stephen made it because it does, it does feel like the, the um, what's sort of missing is we have a lot of people wanting to produce and producing uh, materials, but because no one on the other end is really engaging with it as much, or certainly not in a formal way, um, we don't know whether the materials are fit for purpose. And the only way we'll figure out uh, whether the materials are fit for purpose are by literally sitting down with them and someone else uh, trying to run them. We've developed these events to try to do this, but ultimately we see this as something that should be happening within a research lab. You know, you're gonna uh, 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 submit a paper, we'll get some of your peers to try and reproduce it. You know, we, this should start becoming embedded within re our culture. Um, but I do wanna point to the sec, that sort of leads to the second point as well, which um, it is still, I understand why people find it difficult because we talk a lot about um, you open your code and yes, uh, your code is good enough, you should open it, that's a good starting point. But then eventually if it is gonna be of any use, there are then certain levels of standards and quality that it needs to meet for someone to be able to reuse it. And we've not got to the point where we're actually defining what what it is, what the expectations are. When you say I've, I've, I've published reproducible code with my paper, what does that actually entail? And 
does it differ depending on the language, which I would say it does. Um, so now we're getting into the nitty gritty, I would say. We've made good progress, but now we're really getting down to the, to the details. And if uh, others have something to add. Uh, for a lot of, Dr. For love, have something to add? Yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, it's best to have um, you know, well-organized code and uh, um, clearly organized data and uh, curated and annotated. Um, but at the moment when there is still no culture to share, um, it is viewed as a barrier even the people who think they might be willing to share inside without anyone telling them, they think, oh, but my code is not pretty or my data is a mess, so I'm not going to share it. Um, that's why I emphasize that, you know, just dump it, just share everything. So we share, you know, I've, I've been in a similar panel where they ask me, well, what should we share? You know, we have hundreds of data sets and share all of it. We just shared from that 2012 paper, I mean, 4,000 data sets, you know, a gigabyte of data, that's, that's all we got, you know, maybe it's not so much for other, some fields, but it's a lot for others, but that's just everything, and it's a mess, uh, but at least we signal that it, we are open, and then if somebody actually wants to look at it and has questions, um, we will put additional effort to answer those, uh, and then eventually, once it gets rolling, then the new experiments, new uh, efforts will be organized from the start and designed to be clear and reproducible and well documented, which I guess they should all have been already, but okay, in practice, they're not often, but it doesn't mean they shouldn't be shared. Can I, um, Can I respond yes, Etienne, <laughs> uh, Etienne was, was already uh, muted, so I, was, I think he wants to say something. Yeah, so um, I think that uh, code generally has a, a step, uh, uh, is a bit ahead of the curve in many ways because um, there were a lot of incentives and practices and uh, a culture already of sharing code, open source and these sort of things. Um, when it comes to other work, uh, uh, experimental work, like in psychology, for example, let's just pick one, uh, one of my favorites. Um, I'm a, psycho I'm a software engineer by training, but then I, um, I, uh, I became a psychologist and neuroscientist. So I'm, 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 I'm jumping, uh, oscillating between these two fields. And I find that the, 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 um, uh, the entry level to be able to produce or reproduce work, as, which is experimental, is actually much higher for, psychology, for, for experimental work. And so for Olaf, for example, how long did it take you uh, to, uh, to run your first experiment? Uh, and then how long did it take you in total to, um, to reproduce somebody else's uh, uh, work? And, and, and the extent of the reproduction was mostly about rerunning re the analysis or, or checking the results, not actually running the experiment, right? Yeah, I don't know, should I answer or should we give Anna back the floor? Um, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so uh, if I wanted to actually reproduce uh, exactly an experiment, now it might not be possible because they work with different samples and on different equipment, but uh, if I wanted to come close and just focus on that, that's not really possible because it would take uh, years and hundreds of thousands of dollars and many man hours. Um, so yes, you're right. Um, it is a reanalysis. Uh, so it's a reproduction of conclusions based on the same data that they took that strictly speaking, we did. We did do more than that. We did publish uh, Nature Physics uh, in a lesser journal, um, similar data with different conclusions, which we already had going at the time. Um, and there are a couple other examples like that where um, another big group was doing a big effort in the same direction and saw this paper turned and had data where they could just publish it and say, no, it's not like that. Um, but yeah, by and large, it will be, uh, you know, once the data is available, you will be able to check for things like 
do the figures correspond to the data and are they representative and uh, have all the cross checks been done in the original experiment some of it like real time data selection when you when the data appear on your screen and you say ah that doesn't look good uh, let's move over uh, that is difficult to verify you need at least lab journals and there are some privacy issues with that that you may not be able to get access to lab journals um, Anna, you have something to say, I think. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, um, to make sure I made clear that I'm not criticizing at all code that is published uh, as is, and we, we we do. That's why we call our events like a sandbox environment because the any feedback that authors get is is um, st uh, strictly with uh, f coming from a good place. We're not criticizing, and 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 to me. We can't really criticize because we haven't set any standards. We haven't said a reproducible paper consists of this, this, and this, and this. So we, you know, I'm not, I'm not criticizing anyone. And it is great that that things are being published. Uh, but I think the act of trying to work with someone else's code can really make you understand uh, what it takes and help you improve um, your own work and ultimately start setting. Uh, some maybe start with internal standards, but once you start having some conventions around what a reproducible uh, output is, paper or compendium, I like to call them, as Stephen mentioned, then actually it becomes much easier. It's less investment because you have some guidelines, you have uh, um, a way of thinking about these things. You don't have to figure it all out on your own from the start. Um, yeah, that, I think that's that's kind of the point I wanted to make, and that sort of I, what I feel the next step should be in terms of uh, how we help the community. So we help with more specific guidelines. Even? Hmm. Uh, yes, just to sort of feed on what Anna was saying. I. I if a I mean, some so for example, some communities are pretty good at sharing. I think they're rare, but I think they're good. And I think I look to genomics, I think, as a particularly good case study. So just down the road from me is about 20 miles away is the Sanger Center, which in the late 90s was in a rush to uh, uh, get the human genome before uh, Craig Ventner did. And it was all made public within 24 hours, right? So the data just came straight off the sequencing machines into uh, FTP servers. And that community has a very good uh, reputation for sharing the data and then sharing the code, right? The, uh, within the R world, there's the bioconductor system, which is fabulous. And so there, they do have standards. And I think the community expect, you know, when you publish, you're expected to, uh, to sort of work within that framework. In other areas, there's no chance of doing that. And if you're an earlier adopter, like Sergey said, if you just say, here's all my data. And I was really worried when you said this, Sergey, that you said, for example, if people have questions, you're going to try and devote, I can't remember how you said it, but something like if people have questions or whatever, you would devote some resource to trying to, you know, to answer them. I think that's great, but it's, it could be a huge time sink, right? So the, the Barnes article was just like, here, here's the stuff, you know, caveat emptor, if you want it, it's, it's there. Because if you're, if you're an earlier adopter and you're providing all this data, and being a good citizen, that may come at the cost where other people just expect you to sort of end, answer endless bug reports and, and so forth. So, you know, it's really hard to get the, the culture right. And I think it really, you know, I think it just takes time and patience. And like, for example, I think I'm a neuroscientist as well. Um, and I see, for example, neuroimaging is doing pretty well. They have good standards with particular software packages that they tend to use. Uh, there are databases for supporting it. In my area, in neurophysiology, there's not, right? Everybody is still in their own little uh, enclave and doing their own little thing. 
So things do take a long time. And I think what Anna is suggesting, this, this notion of just trying to support and help, I think is, is, is critical rather than forcing, you know, too early, putting too early, putting standards and commitments onto people because, you know, people will just burn out, I think, if, if, if that happens. And, so, and co-check is the same. If a code, if a piece of code doesn't work, we don't just write a certificate saying this was a failure. We tend to then uh, work with the author. It's not a, it's not anonymous, so the the, the review is, is sort of uh, each person knows the other, the author and the code checker. And by that way, they can have a productive discussion to get the code to a state where it does work, and that's that's a supportive collaborative process and so that's that's really where i think we can really make inroads can i um i think actually you touched something that, that is really the, the the crux of 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 everything is it's a human factor that is really important and people who um and i think anna both anna and you steven you um mentioned um that you um uh, enforce a positive culture that you're not criticizing anybody and so on. And I think this is really, really important. In my experience, um, uh, wanting to train users or train people to do better statistics, for example, or to, uh, um, uh, to think about uh, their designs and their experiments, um, the, the main barrier that I find is that people are um, scared a little bit. Um, because uh, we are now researchers, we got a PhD, we uh, had uh, blood, sweat and tears, it was really hard and we we're meant to be experts. We're not meant to be students anymore. Uh, and so um, uh, when you turn back and you said, well, I've spent six or seven years learning statistics and I know this and really I should know that. Um, and, uh, and people are, yeah, it, there's a bit of a an emotional turmoil about needing to 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 be better, um, and and in my experience, this is the main the main barrier to um, to sort of uh, trying to create a culture change. Yeah, it's definitely a factor. Um, the the embarrassment, you know, a student might feel that they will be disadvantaged if they share their you know sloppy notes or you know, perceived as sloppy maybe they're actually fine or on par with what everybody else does um so that's definitely a factor um what steven mentioned is not actually a factor um like for instance i've been sharing data for the last year and i have not had trouble people asking me for it uh, uh, because the the interest in uh, the data being shared is actually greater than interest in checking the data that's been shared uh, for the moment. No, people don't have habit of doing that. Um, I think if that starts happening, like people start asking me, actually, some of the reviewers start asking um, now. So that's interesting. They say, oh, you published 9,000 data sets, but you haven't done the analysis. So I have to go back and, uh, you know, so if, if that starts happening more and more, it will only force me once I already shared, right? It will be only force me to organize it better. So I don't have to answer each individual question, uh, right? So that will be a positive, um, but, uh, but at the moment it's not really a problem. People don't get inundated with these requests. It just doesn't exist. Nobody checks. Uh, and in the future, I would be happy if that starts happening. I spend a lot more effort uh, requesting data from people who refuse to share it than asking for clarifications for the data that has been shared. Anna, go ahead. Yeah, um, that was exactly the point I wanted to make, actually, that um, I think this is kind of what we're what um, the point of reaper hack is in some ways is that people worry about the sloppiness or whatever. The truth is no one is out there really looking for your data or your, it's really hard to get people to engage, you know, and often people put a lot of effort into getting stuff out and no one is engaging on the other side. So they don't know if it works uh, and they might even get discouraged if people start putting a lot of effort in and no one is engaging with their efforts. 
then they, they, they might well give up. They might just see this as another tick boxing exercise and just be like, oh yeah, here's some code, here's some whatever. Yeah, I've done it. And, and to me, I think we should discourage that because I think there is value um, in having these materials available for building on them. Uh, and this is another thing that I think some participants get out of the Rebra Hack experience is that they get the value for the community of just engaging with, with the materials. So uh, lots of uh, participants have, have, have chosen maybe a paper that's in their domain and seen something that they're like, even if it's just code for a plot and they're like, oh, I, I'm gonna use that. I'm gonna use that plotting technique or that package or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there is, we need to try and engage with the efforts that people are making to publish these materials in a more systematic way, I think. Let me pick up this uh, flow when there is one uh, question from Eric also in the chat uh, that it connects with what uh, uh, Dr. Frilov said in his presentation when you said, just dump it, just dump the data. Uh, he asked if it includes various metadata that help researchers connect to them to your papers and or related work. And then I would then already ask you, so well, all of you, then what are the barriers for these uh, data sharing and code sharing that you have seen or that you, you feel somehow? Should I start? Because uh, I said dump it. Uh, so uh, I can tell you what we do and then we can generalize. So um, uh, of course, unreferenced data is useless. It's just some files with numbers, right? I mean, it may be useful for some uh, research integrity investigation to check if you manipulated your files, but nothing else. Um, so in, in, in every uh, experiment that I'm aware of, there is, there is layers of analysis and uh, there is the, the original source uh, data and then there's process data, but there's also uh, lab journals where it's recorded what you were doing at the time. And then there's post analysis, like a PowerPoint file or OneNote or whatever Word file where you uh, plot and comment and think about the data. There's uh, you know, Python notebooks where you interact with the data, uh, you know, fit it, uh, you know. Um, and so we dump it, all of it. Right, so we don't make uh, any files on purpose for Zenodo. We just share all we all we got. If there was a group meeting presentation where a student shared preliminary, you know, analysis, if it's complete enough, we'll put it on Zenodo, and and then it has all the data file names in it, so you can go in the data folder and get the file and plot it yourself, uh, and there'll be a reference to plotting software that we used, or in the more in the newer uh, experiments uh, an actual python code that plotted it or something like that um so yeah every every uh, yeah there needs to be some kind of uh, guide for your repository but my point is you don't need to manicure and create uh put a special effort necessarily if you want you can into curating and uh, making your data more accessible i mean if you have the time please do it it would be fantastic and appreciated but if you don't you probably already have a bunch of stuff uh from the time that you that you were doing this work that you can just at least use as a starting point if not just uh, you know share if you have like zero embarrassment barrier than just share whatever you know whatever I, whatever you wrote at the time i agree that's what i tell people as well to just share everything but they but they do are i mean they they are scared most people and i've had students not wanting to share their presentations for example for some personal reasons I ask what kind of reasons? If... Um, that's a good question. I'm not too sure. So it was mostly about uh, not wanting to make a fool of themselves um, or something like that. Um, sort of 
really just simple reasons, not anything big, majors, like just insecurity, I think. Tiffany, you raised yeah. your hand. Thank you. Um, so uh, yes, again, and sort of following on from the last question, the technical issues are much easier to solve than the human issues. So, you know, we now have, you know, it's amazing, you know, thanks to uh, CERN, we have Zenodo, which just offers these huge data repositories for us just to throw, you know, throw large data sets at so you can just dump everything by and large in in, in many fields not all of course <clears throat> but so the the technical side of things has been solved again it's the human issues and we heard you know you asking about what reasons there are that people don't share uh the uh, another practical thing is just that of time you know to to annotate everything takes a takes a big investment i still urge people to do it for two reasons. One is you normally don't just do an experiment and then just forget about it. You'll normally come back to that experiment a year later or two years later. And so the number one beneficiary of that work where you, you spend your time annotating it will be your own group, right? So it's, it's, to me, it's worth putting in a little bit of effort. And then if you want to do it properly, you can always, go the route of trying to get a data paper out of it, which I think, I mean, I, I, I like data papers a lot. They're kind of no nonsense, right? It's just a description of there's the data. There's no, you don't need to provide any, you know, a particular set of results. You just say, here are the conditions under which I collected these data. These are the formats of the files, have at it, right? And there's no, you know, there's no sort of complicating need to try and make a good story out of it. Um, so I do think data papers are a good way of giving people credit by which uh, they can, you know, then invest the time to, uh, to write these things up properly, because it is a huge endeavor, you're right, you know, experiments now are quite complex and putting all this metadata down is a thankless task, right, unless you're super organized and you do it all as you're going along, which invariably doesn't tend to happen, it's a very, it's, it's a hard thankless task um you know other groups will complain if it's not done and if it is done you know they sort of almost take it for granted so it, it is a thankless task so we do need to think about credit and reward mechanisms by which we could do that um i should add, add a disclaimer i was a, until recently an editorial on the editorial board of scientific data which is one of these uh, data journals but uh, i am no more so i feel i'm not advertising them So I could um, I could um, add this dimension to the discussion. Uh, um, so yes, th th there is a lot of um, social issues and but still some technical issues that could help greatly. There could be government incentives or mandates even to share data. Um, but if we strip it all down, uh, when you were doing research, you obtained a set of original source data, whether it was numerical or observational or uh, a, um, a survey or an experiment in a lab, uh, there is that body of data. Uh, even, so suppose there's zero annotation or zero metadata, that still exists. Um, and uh, you, you could be uh, required or asked or in, incentivized to share that as a layer right and then as a next layer you could annotate it with either existing or new notes um for instance if somebody asks you to or if you would like to engage with people on uh, reproducibility or follow-ups or expansion reuse of your data right so at least the zero level the original source data um you could share so then i go back on my answer i said yeah we dump everything um i mean we could dump just the original data so if there is for instance a research integrity investigation 
um, in the future, they could uh, look back at that and compare it to our papers, right? And this should be zero effort, right? Because you need, should have a folder on your computer with all that data. You just share it. It's maybe not so useful to others, but it, it, then it's already out there. I think this connects well to um, a question that is in the chat and uh, it's in the Reddit said a few words regarding it, but maybe he wants to say more. Um, so to play the devil, I will just read it, to play the devil's advocate for a moment, do you think there could be an intimidation aspect or a chilling effect for would be reproduced as seeing a big dumped project versus a curated package with a readme or package list? Over time, would reproduces start to default to, oh, they dump it so much stuff, it, it should be okay. It should be fine. Can I start? Um, this sounds a, a kind of a, a little bit like um, a, a friend of mine had a postdoc, uh, like maybe last year, and she said basically her whole postdoc was to take this hard drive figure out what everything was and then continue on the research. So here, I, I kind of really agree with Stephen that, that um, trying to push this as this is gonna be good for you and your research lab is probably the most effective way to go about it. Um, I do think there is an element of, of, of training even with just really basic tips that is lacking. So I think there's expectations of publishing data but, but not really, or code, but again, we're not really, maybe we're training for better programming, but not necessarily how, how to publish it better. Um, and uh, I see funders actually doing a better job at trying to address this. For example, uh, NERC um, here in the UK have asked for all data that is created with NERC money to be published. Uh, but then they realized that to demand this meant they needed to invest and their PhDs, uh, they, they were funded in some training for them. So I've actually been involved in this training for five, six years now. And it does help if you tell PhD students right at the start, you know, a few basic tips and tricks, a few expectations. So they understand that it's not just about publishing papers. There's more to their research. There's more value in these digital sort of resources they're creating. And you would be surprised, actually, we do go into metadata and even structured metadata and ontologies and what have you, which can be scary. But it's amazing how much just some tips on good file naming, good file structure, you know, get some metadata in your file names and just a simple good readme. Uh, and ideally, just what are the columns in your data? You know, just as far as that can get you a long way uh, with data. And as for code, um, you know, I work a lot in R and I really, what I like about how the R community has, has sort of approached this is they've said, okay, you've got a paper and an analysis that's in R. Well, the best way to share code in R is the R package. Um, so you might as well create your analysis in R, around an R package. We've also got these documents uh, that, that you can uh, uh, have code and data and output in them. You might as well use that for your paper. Uh, and then if you do this, then what opens up is a, a strict convention that already exists that you don't have to figure out on your own for managing all, all your materials. Uh, there's, there's software and tools to help you check your code and test your code and publish your code. Uh, and then finally, what I like is that there's been a, a, a really cool package called RR Tools built on top of all that that can help you actually set up a project that's more relevant for a, a research compendium, right? So for an academic paper. So it's got a readme that, that's, that is a template that you can fill in that guides you towards, you know, what a publication would need rather than a paper. It has facilities for sharing your data within it, uh, you know, following our convention. So uh, yeah, that, when I talk about standards and conventions, that's sort of what I mean. It, it, it's more, can we jump on convention that already exists because of the tools we're, we're ready to sort of redeploy that for our purposes. Yeah, I think eventually it would be great to converge on a, a fixed set of um, data formats. Probably not possible to 
sort of enforce it at this stage because every little lab, like my 10 people use one format and next door they use another format. Um, but if we start sharing, we will see, oh, uh, we will start resolving these issues. But uh, I also agree strongly that um, offering a course on data management, um, maybe an online course, and then just sending all your students there, come back with a certificate uh, would go a long way. Um, and if they all take the same course, they might start doing the same things about their data. So uh, I think that that should be, that should be encouraged and uh, such courses should exist in different fields. Anna, do you know anything if, if uh, there are courses like this elsewhere? Uh, you said you're, you're doing uh, those courses. Do you have any info? I, I don't really. Um, I mean, some of the course actually uh, I've taken, especially the part about file naming and, and, and file organization, there's a, there's a really good carpentries course uh, so for, on, on just general good file naming and, and organizing your project that's sort of generic. And, and we do use uh, some of that. Uh, but yeah, this was commissioned especially by NERC uh, or, or, or actually a, a one of their DDPs, their doctoral training partnerships to target specifically first year PhD students. So um, I'm sure li there are, you know, libraries do this sort of training, but I think there's a lot of focus in sometimes the data management um, training focuses on getting the data management plan completed. I don't know if people are familiar with this. So it, it's it, often you're asked to do a data management plan at the beginning of a research project, but that tends to feel a little bit administrative as well. Uh, it gets you thinking, but it, it feels like another tick box. And what we wanted to do with this course is do it really practical with practical exercises, creating metadata and, and you know, giving really practical tips like, uh, I don't know, how to encode null values and just things that they're going to see um, in their day to day uh, life from a researcher's perspective. Um, but no, I, I think the Carpentries is a good good place to start. I'll, I'll try and find a link to that uh, course. Thank you. Um, Eric Olson from COS, the Center for Open Science, has just uh, said in the chat that COS has data, manage mod data management modules launching later this year. I think it is worth the advertisement. Uh, it's really, uh, it really fits the, the discussion here. And I would pull up for one more um, question or topic that didn't come up um, in the discussion yet. Uh, whether you, I wonder whether you think that authors or perhaps the one or two authors among the list of authors in the paper or all of them, uh, do you feel they they fear sharing for some some secrecy, some some willing to not disclose uh, research secrets? Is there a lot of this? Do you do you observe this kind of thing too? And by the way, if you can add on on the top of that, because I already suppose the answer is yes from your face expressions. Uh, how to address this? What we, what will you you would say? <laughs> Stephen, go ahead. Uh, so yes, there are. There are certainly lots of domains where it is seen to be giving away your competitive advantage if you share your code or your data. Um, I have, I have, I'd say on the whole, in my field, in in my immediate field, there is, you know, if you're in a community and you're known to each other, there is, you know, you, if you ask for somebody's data, you tend to get it. 20 years ago, that used to come with a little bit of a backhand. Well, I'm sharing my data with you. So if you do anything with it, you know, uh, you, you have an expectation of being on the paper just for sharing your data, right? Now that, that I think thankfully has 
subsided a lot. But uh, why would you know? Why would groups want to give away their valuable resource, right? If somebody and I've 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 had people and I don't have a good answer for this, but people have said to me, you know, I've spent twenty years building up my reputation by having this particular code base. I collaborate with people who want me to run my software on on their data. We write joint papers. This is my unique selling point within the scientific community. So by sharing it, I'm giving away my my sort of unique uh, selling point within within science. And it's very hard. I mean, I I I struggled to convince any. Uh, you know, it's only happened a couple of times, but I've struggled to be able to convince them. And you know, in a certain sense, you can't because it's a very entrenched view. The problem, of course, is about as always, again, the human element is how do you give people credit for mm, doing this? Exactly. Right? We don't think you can now give credit just for sharing data because it's up there. And that, that seems, I think that seems right. But if, for example, like let's say I wanted to analyze some of Sergey's data and one email turned into sort of three months of discussions about what he'd done and what this meant and so forth, the threshold for collaboration or uh, for work may have passed so that, you know, if I were to write a paper, it would be appropriate for Sergey to be on it. Um, so again, it comes down to this issue of, you know, how, how can we get people's selfish interests to be aligned with, with sort of what's good for science as in, as in the sharing? Um, and I don't have a good answer just to say, you know, I do think it changes over time. I think neuroscience is coming along. Uh, it's not it's not anywhere near other fields, but uh, I think I'm optimistic that, you know, we we should be sharing more and I think more and more people are, are turning around to it. And the thing that I would point to in that regard is data is preprints, right? So. A lot of people in physics have been using preprints since, you know, since our like, arch archive is now 30 years old, right? And, you know, it's, it's going to be around. Bioarchive, by contrast, is only a few years old, and its usage has gone through the roof in the last year or two, right? And that's people starting to share more earlier because they're trying to get rid of this notion that, you know, we can only share when we've got the paper out in nature or whatever. So I do think we're. I do think we're. I. I think the preprints gives me optimism that we're we're at least going in the right direction. I have um some experience. So in my PhD, I designed this very nice piece of software, a three D, um, uh, animation visualization, uh, software, and my university, uh, my advisor, asked me to not to an open source and not give the code away. And he uh, wanted to patent the software and, and keep it. And now if, if anybody wants to have access, um, they have to go to, to, to Geneva to, to, to do it. They can ask for a license for the, the small price of uh, 500 Swiss francs. Um, and so my I, I just feel really sad about this. And so uh, I think at the time, I probably would have tried to convince him that he would get more citations if he actually shared the code um, rather than keeping it for himself um, uh, at the time. So I, I think that there is actually evidence that the more you share, the more people we speak about, right? Um, yeah, so we are definitely sharing more. Uh, you know, um, I think uh, Leibniz was writing stuff and putting it in his desk and he got scooped for that famously. Uh, and uh, the, the culture then was uh, kind of like a card game. Uh, you know, oh, you publish this. Well, I had this in my drawer for the last 15 years. So how about that? And we are uh, farther along than that, that's for sure. Um, Physicists did do a good job with archive and sharing preprints, but as far as reproducibility crisis and, uh, you know, um, 
uh, reckoning with it and looking for solutions, then I would say medical sciences, social sciences are actually way ahead of uh, physicists. We're just now <laughs> understanding that some of the fields are really in trouble. Um, as far as Cassio's uh, question goes, which was, wait a minute, what did you ask? about secrecy <laughs> oh yeah secrecy why, and hesitancy why people keep it secrecy yeah. and i was smiling uh i mean it's like you know i'm not in a representative cohort right now because most people i've been asking data from had very good reasons probably to not show it because now their papers are starting to get retracted um and that's one you know that's one red flag you know, if you ask for data and they share nothing or very little, that's a actually a, that's actually a red flag. Um, now, another component that was not mentioned is just uh, not being educated about your responsibilities and your benefits, likewise, of sharing. Uh, in some cases, you actually have you actually have to share by the journal policy or your national funders, policy. Yeah or the funding agency policy. So in Europe, they do a much better job with that. In the United States, we are, we have a set of, you know, 500 different policies for each agency and each university. And, um, but for instance, in the Netherlands, there is a national code of conduct for research integrity. And it says on any request you have to share. And okay, it's not a, you don't go to jail if you don't share, of course. It's not a law of the land. Uh, but it is a code of conduct. Um, so some of it is just education, right? You published in science, you did sign somewhere that uh, you have to sh make your data available. And then there is a debate about what constitutes, um, you know, all the data you have to make available. If you have a conflict of interest, like you filed a patent, uh, you have to disclose it. And if you haven't disclosed it, it means you don't have it. That means you have to share. So there's a lot of structure already kind of in place, just not enforced. And education about that can take you a long way. And we already discussed that there could be benefits to sharing, like more citations. I guess if uh, in my case, uh, I don't, I'm not afraid of being scooped from sharing because to repeat this experiment, you have to have a million dollar lab and unique collaborations that I've established with other groups that provide me materials and stuff. So I'm not really worried about that, but I can see how if you put a lot of effort in code, um, then you can get scooped. I guess uh, a way to do it is to not do it on public dollar, but uh, to create a company and develop this code this way. Um, but you guys are, you, the three of you are code experts and I am uh, a lab rat. So you, you, should, you should tell me how to do about code. I don't write valuable code. I guess that's a good question for Steven. I'm not quite sure how to answer. Yeah, you're live. You were live. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I think the easiest way to share code is if you've got one minute, is you just zip it up and you stick it in with your, you know, you have a separate folder and you stick it in with your with your data. Um, no, I guess the question, sorry, is how to get credit for code, right? Oh, how to get uh, how to get credit for code? That's that's a different matter. But I am exploring that with because I mean, in a, in a in a very deep sense, code is data, right? So just just as if there are data journals where where are where are the journals the way you can publish your code and so it's not quite there yet but there are journals for example one that i've worked with giga science where they publish workflows which is more than just one or two files but it's sort of the whole description and there what you're publishing and getting credit for is to say well if you've got this type of data this is the kind of sequence of programs that I run to generate these kinds of outputs. Um, now that's not quite at the level of, you know, if you've got, you know, for example, in your lab, if you've got, if you're the only person in the world to have this particular machine, 
then probably there isn't a you know there isn't a package unless you write it so you know it's very bespoke bits of code um i can't think of a, of a direct way that you get credit for that within the uh within the community except of course if you give it a url and if you ask colleagues when they uh, if they write papers using your code they should cite some something that you can then show you can then point to to get credit um and the journal that's again so i'm thinking uh probably for slightly more polished packages there's the journal of open source software which lives entirely on github where if you write pieces of code with documentation you you can publish papers that get in there but maybe etienne has experience through the rescience project of other yeah so like we follow the the just model and we do the same thing i think that uh, our authors would keep their repository private until the moment where they think that they can share it uh, and then everything is is uh is, is public um i do note that we have a three minute warning uh for the session um, can I just make one quick comment that there, there's an absolutely no reason you can't publish your code in Zenodo or, you know, at the University of Sheffield, we have a similar repository called Orda. You can publish data there. You can publish code. Uh, that, yeah, there's absolutely no reason you can't get a DOI for your code uh, that, that, that would need to be cited if someone used it. Um, I, I think it'd be unlikely if it's just the code associated with a paper and you might want to publish it as a compendium altogether with one DOI, paper, code, and, and data. Um, but then if it's a package as well, you, you can publish those in, in, in Zenodo and then potentially, like if it's an R package, it could go through the R open Sci review, uh, which actually gives you a lot of credit if you have a package gone through the R open Sci uh, review in the R community, research community. Okay, so we have only two minutes left. Um, we'll just read what, what, what just came in the chat. Um, conversely, uh, I'm just read as is. Conversely, I would argue it's not the scientists who crave credit, but the academic system requiring credit as currency for career promotion. Perhaps reform in, in that domain would solve problems too. And Etienne has uh, answered that any reform of the incentive system would be good. <laughs> Uh, I agree. I, I see Anna is nodding and Sergey is also nodding. I think we kind of all agree with that. Um, so since we have only two minutes left, I guess uh, I will close the questions here. But uh, if the panelists would like to say some ending words, um, you can have like 30 seconds. If you do not want to say anything, that's fine too. Does anyone want to uh, leave any final remarks? Share your data and code, and we'll see what comes next. And if other people share their code and data, go play with it and, and see what comes out of it. Yeah, you'll be fine, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, taking, taking the first step is often quite nerve wracking, but uh, you know, we, disasters don't tend to happen. People tend to be quite supportive, so um, and like I'm, I'm, I'm sure many people on, you know, uh, like if, if people wanted to, to find out more about getting started, I'd be happy to, uh, to take questions offline, um, just, just to help people get started. Okay, cool. thank you. Well, I guess the, the big, the big takeaway from this session is the just share share everything and we sort things out later and don't forget to be nice uh i guess that was the human factor in a sense too and be patient so uh with this i think we can close this uh this panel thank you all uh for participating uh and from the different perspectives that we could see that we could have uh here today um it made me remember all the sessions that we saw that I've seen uh, throughout Meta Science this week. 
And I think it, it is really a lot related uh, with the, the session before I was, and there was a session about in, in, uh, reproducibility culture in social sciences. Uh, in the end, uh, I guess we can really all collaborate and have uh, uh, some good insights and improvement for all of us. So um, thank, you, thank you again for everyone to come in with this. I guess we can uh, close this panel. Thank, thank you. you all. Hi, everyone. Thank you.